Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, and Keith Newmeyer are three successful resource investors coming together for one simple reason, to buy cheap assets from distressed companies and seize this once in a decade opportunity to buy gold, silver, and other mineral projects for pennies on the dollar. First Mining Finance Corp, trading on the TSX Venture under FF, a recently launched venture with the sole purpose to acquire advanced stage natural resource projects and starting on day one with 18 projects, management has already identified over 60 additional projects to acquire. Learn more about First Mining Finance at Future Money Trends slash Invest Right. Greetings and thank you for joining us at FutureMoneyTrends.com. I'm here with a very special guest. He gets a lot of media uh, invites. Uh, he's asked to speak to college universities around the country. Uh, he was just a keynote speaker at a uranium conference in France. And my guest today is a New York Times best-selling author. He is known as one of the most disciplined stock pickers in the world. And that comes from an investing legend uh, in the natural resource space, Doug Casey. Uh, our guest is Marin Katusa of Katusa Research, where right now you can actually go to katusaresearch.com and get all the amazing information that hedge fund managers and legendary investors seek the information from Marin, and it's right there on his website. He is truly leveling the playing field for people who want to have an honest, unbiased opinion on what they should look at in a very risky sector. Marin, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure, Dan. Well, hey, Marin, I I, uh, I, I know you're a busy guy and um, you talk to a lot of people. You do a lot of traveling. You've been to more countries than I, I even knew existed. And uh, just before this call, you said you're about to go to 10 countries, or excuse me, seven countries in 10 days. So, uh, I first want to start off with uh, just by asking you the Fed decision. You know, this is market noise, but this this is this a significant event that, you know, here they've been saying we're in recovery for six years and they can't even raise the rates a quarter of a point. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that on my website. I'm having a lot of fun writing my own thoughts and doing it for free because when you run your own firm, you can do whatever you want. So, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting how I wrote three months ago why if you use game theory, like my background's mathematics, I did my minor in philosophy, um, I said that the best game plan for Janet Yellen and the Fed was not to do anything. And I explained on my website three months ago why that would happen. And you basically, you know, I tried to explain it, I remember when we were kids, 25, 30 years ago, we would read those uh, books, Choose Your Own Adventure. Yeah. That's basically the logic. Uh, I tried to write it in a fun way. That's essentially where Janet Yellen was at. I talk about the history of the Fed and understanding what they need to do. So that was something that I really wanted people to understand. And, uh, you know, and that I published on May 6, 2015. I call it Pushing Out the Risk Curve. And, uh, it's played out the way I thought it would and how I positioned myself on May 6th. I said, this is what you want to do to position yourself to benefit from it. Okay, so they they, they haven't raised interest rates, uh, gosh, in um, since I think 2005 or 2006 was the last time they actually raised rates. So essentially central planners today, anybody who's a central planner, of significance, they haven't even raised rates uh, in their in their history in their career. Um, do you think a Fed rate increase will come, or do you think it's simply uh, the inflationary forces of the Fed versus the natural forces of deflation for the next five ten years here? Look, Dan, you were at the conference a few years ago when I essentially got heckled and booed at my own conference when I was with the Casey crew. But I said, we are in def look at all these deflationary forces. You've nailed it on the head. And the reality here is, is that we are an interconnected world. What happens in China affects us here and vice versa. Um, so the reality here is, is that the Fed could have what they want in an ideal world, but they have so many factors to, to come in, the emerging markets, China. And the reality here is, is that we are in a deflationary environment. And it's not just me saying, you got some of the smartest guys, Ray Dalio, all these guys that I pay attention to are saying the same thing. So what does this all mean? You know, 
one fed if you look at the actual transcripts much better to actually read the transcripts because it's a lot faster than to like actually list the press conferences just rip through the transcripts one of the nine who voted against the raise actually said that by the end of 2016 we'll have a negative rate a negative US Fed rate that was something really interesting that's never happened before nobody's talking about that uh, it was a nine to one vote the one uh, you know hawkish he's doing it more for his reputation but when you got nine to one you think they're gonna raise it in the next meeting hell no nine to one Dan so basically nine of the people are saying we're not going to raise rates here. So they can't just do a 180 and the world's not going to solve itself in, in the next two months. So what does this mean? You know, They're going to have to have more financial heroin in the markets. And just like any drug addic addiction, you need more drugs for less of a high. And that's what we're going to have to get into in these markets. So the big question, and I wrote... I encourage everybody to read my China bubble theory and I break down the China markets is what is China going to do and that's really important question. Remember one third, I have a whole chapter of this in my book, one third of all of the treasury notes are owned by China. You know that they've sold 12% of their holdings? The Chinese are not wow. stupid. How come no one's talking about this Dan? I, that's why I love doing your, uh, you know, your media platform because you're not looking for what the mainstream saying. You're looking for what the guys managing money are thinking, and that's what I'm thinking. Going, holy crap! You know, if somebody blew out 15 percent of a position and they own one third of the stock, you want to pay attention, right? Right. So why is it any different when the Chinese who own one third, uh, maybe just slightly under one third, but just for number's sake, let's say a third? And they've sold a little over 12% of their U.S. dollars, and it didn't even make a headline in the Wall Street Journal. It's not in Forbes. It's not in NBC. It wasn't even mentioned in the debate in the GOP. So, you know, they're talking Iran, and they're talking, you know, all these words. There's some serious changes going on, you know, and, and the Chinese are going to continue to ease their currency. They have to. We are in a currency war. And it's a deflationary pressures. And this is a market. Remember, Dan, the key, when you study deflation, first of all, no one's ever, anyone investing, anyone old enough to invest, even Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, nobody's ever experienced a true deflation who's actually investing today. So all we have to go off by is history. Okay, and remember, history is written in ways that you got to be very careful on your, your perception and interpretation of history. So the mathematics of a deflation is everybody loses. But the key is, is he who has cash loses the least. Hmm. And is gold cash? Well, if you believe gold is cash, which for the last, you know, over 5,000 years, gold has been cash. It's been the most stable form of cash. You want to start thinking about how to position yourself in gold. You know, when you look at guys like uh, Druckenmiller, Dalio, these guys are all exposing themselves to gold in different ways. So gold is going to have its time here. But, you know, remember, at the early stages in a deflationary, everything goes down, but the smart guys are positioning themselves for this. Okay, now you're an expert in the natural resource sector, and that is where you have had tremendous, tremendous, spectacular success, uh, attracting uh, partners like like the Rick Rules of the world, the Doug Casey's, the the Ross Beatties, uh, the Lucas Lundins. So when you when you look at that overall economic thesis you just kind of laid out here, where we're in a currency war, there's deflationary forces, but now you've got um, a cyclical resource sector which is at a, a kind of, and correct me if I'm wrong, an extremely cyclical low. Uh, you know, when you look at the TSX chart for 15, 20 years, uh, you look at the other cycles we've been in, this seems to be a pretty brutal bear market that we've already gone through. So, uh, you know, just looking at that, you would say, or at least I would say, this is an opportunity. And now it's certainly, um, the, the, it seems like the, the, it, would, it would be a safer time to get in to resource stocks right now. However, 
let's also consider what you just said in in the previous uh, answer that there's also a deflationary force. So is is the resource market um, okay to get into now, or is it still something we kind of need to be very picky and and cautious about? Dan, a hundred percent, you have to be super picky, super cautious, and you have to pick your your areas and sectors. And even within the sector, you got to be super careful. So, for example, in 2011, I went on national television in my newsletter, anyone willing to talk, I said, stay the hell away from coal, both thermal and met coal. I go, the game has changed. If you understand the math, shale gas, gas is in North America, you know, thermal coal is going to have a hard time to compete to the cleaner, cheaper, green gas, uh, sorry, natural gas. And I said, met coal is going to have a tough time. I got mocked on TV. As you know, I got sick in 2012, took a couple months off, came back. My first big media outlet was back, was talking about tech resources on BNN. When the stock was $55, I said on national television that this was a $25 stock and I would not touch it. And I think it's going to go below $25. That was at the end of 2011. When I came back on it after my heart surgery in 2012, they said, holy crap, Marin, you're right. It's $25 now. What do you see happening next? I go, they go, now is the time to buy? And this is the problem with the markets. Everyone thinks in boom bust. That's not the way the markets really work. You have a, a, a lateral portion that I call the echo. So on TV in 2012, I said, no, it's going to go sideways down for the next few years and it's going to go a lot lower. That company today is $8. Now, what the, why does that company matter? Tech Resources is Canada's largest diversified miner. It's the biggest mining company in Canada. It's the, you know, the New York Yankees of the Canadian mining sector. Two days ago, its debt got classified as junk. So wow. if the largest mining company in the sector got classified as junk, what does that tell you about the rest of all of the sector? <laughs> okay. That said, Yes, I completely agree with you that when everything gets got thrown out of the kitchen, including the you know the baby in the kitchen, everything, there's always going to be gems. And you stick with the right management team, people, 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 people. I know I sound redundant, but look, even in every bear market, in every major correction, if you position yourself right, the right assets get overvalued and they also get undervalued. But there's also that lateral portion. So you've got the vertical price going up and down, but you also got to factor out the timing, the permitting, the capex, you know, the burn rate, all of these factors that go sideways. And I think what I'm positioning my fund, and remember I've stayed over half cash in US dollars. For the last three, four years, I've had a lot of people going, Are you crazy, US dollars. But if you talk to the guys like Doug Casey that I talk to daily to, they're like, wow, Marin, we thought you were really wrong a few years ago talking about the US dollar, the place to be. And I think it's going to continue because what do you want to own? The euro, the the kuna, the yuan, which is going to get devalued here. So the yen, which has been completely blasted out. So the, euro, uh, the US dollar wins by default, but gold is also a currency, if you believe that. There's a lot of people that car call it a barbaric relic. That's fine. I really focus on what is the true value, not relative value. Relative value is that everybody's down, therefore I'm down, but you know, look how much I'm down versus others. That that that's meaningless to me. I look for intrinsic true value. And this market is what I've been waiting for. I'm quite active and the beauty is now you're looking at incredible deals that if you position yourself but take a longer time frame. Dan, I have not changed my story with for the last couple of years, this is what I've been saying to you. Position yourself with the right teams who can survive, consolidate. When I say consolidate, some may hear predator, you know, grab companies with good assets that blew up their financial structure or weren't able to raise the money and survive. There's always things that go on. And in three years maybe or two years or five years, I don't have the answer when, but there's going to be some serious big wins here. Uh, last we spoke, we discussed a company that had just launched, uh, First Mining Finance. It's a Keith Newmeyer company. Uh, you know, I know that you, Rick Rule, Doug Casey, Frank Curzio, Eric Sprott, a lot of people um, are involved in this company, either through recommending it or, or large share ownership. Uh, if you could just give us an update on how the first six months have gone on for this venture for you guys. 
Look, I've known Keith Newmeyer for a long time. Um, I met him when he just started First Majestic Silver. So he came off the win of First Quantum. I got to know his brother Tony, his older brother Tony, really well. This is going back in like 05. I was the first guy to write up First Majestic Silver when it was under a dollar. That stock went to over thirty dollars, okay, in two thousand eleven. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, you know, when you look at it, going, oh my God, a dollar to thirty dollars. But this thing went sideways for many, many, many years. It took uh, six years for it to go from a dollar to uh, thirty dollars. Different market, different time frame. But you know, Keith and I had some pretty tough negotiations. I bought just under ten percent of his company. I wanted to take twenty percent, but I wanted those big warrants. And Keith was strong enough that he didn't need the terms that I wanted to take a big, big position in the company. And he was able to raise the money himself. He wrote a big check himself. The guy is a winner. And he went out and did everything that he said he would do. You know, he just consolidated two new pro- uh, companies. Uh, he's done now three takeovers. And he's grown his base, uh, gold resource base, by over 600%. And obviously, you dilute yourself. And Ironically, I got a call from him, maybe it was two weeks ago in the deal, and I go, you know, I, I don't get it. What am I not getting here, Keith? This ARB opportunity between GCU, Gold Canyon, which he just bought out, which is a very good project. It has its issues just like every single resource project in the market. But, you know, first first mining finance is trading around 33, 34, 35 cents in the market, and you can buy Gold Canyon for around 24, 25 cents, and it's a one for one. And while we were talking, I'm like, Keith, what am I not getting here? Like, I've done my due diligence. I don't understand. There's something wrong here. He's like, no, man, it's just the markets are off. So you can literally buy First Mining Finance through GCU at a huge 20% discount. And that's what I did. I bought a million shares of it for my fund. And I just sat there and I'm on the bid. Because the market is so out of whack, there's emotion. You know, we're entering an area where the shareholders sat there for years in a in a illiquid story. People are happy to get an exit. Then the algos and the day traders jump in. But you know, Keith's a winner. I believe in him. He's buying millions of shares of both First Mining Finance and also the Gold Canyon. I talk to him every other day via email or phone calls, and he's committed to it. And I truly believe he's going to build a real mining company that's going to be prepared for the next mining cycle stick with the right people yeah his insider buying is uh is is tremendous i want to say it's into like the uh since april it's 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 over 30. uh quick question uh, a follow-up question on the projects they've acquired one project they've closed on or they they have i think like let's say 19 projects total but uh the the recent projects they acquired and are in transaction with right now they're all being purchased for less than ten dollars an ounce of gold uh, on those deposits. Uh, if you could give us an idea and the audience an idea of just is is this extreme? I mean, what 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 do these ounces of gold go for? Let's say in a bull market, an average market, and a previous bear market. Well, all we have when you do that that's relative valuation, Dan. So. You know, you're using the hit past historical markets and you're using relative valuation. But, you know, just to put this in perspective, Gold Canyon was a $3 stock at the peak of the market. You know, so literally, Keith, through first mining finance, is buying it for less than 10 cents on the dollar. That's smart. Now, you couldn't, for what the price he's buying the company, you could not drill up even a fifth of that resource if you're lucky even to find it. So that's what I like what someone like Keith is doing or Amir is doing. They're using this market weakness to go and consolidate in a market where it's cheaper to go buy these developed, you know, proven resources than it would be to go develop them yourself because you know, these are high risk projects like it's not easy to get out there and find gold and then gold with 40 millions of drilling. So, you know, he's using the right strategy, but you have to have a long term strategy for this. With my fund, I believe in Keith, so I'm going long. Great. Um, 
Marin, th- thank you so much for uh, shedding some light on first mining finance and uh, all your knowledge about the resource sector and the economy. Uh, your previous book, it's a New York Times bestseller. Wanted to see if we could get a sneak peek into the new book you're working on. And also, how in the heck do you have time to write a new book? You're traveling so much. And by the way, congratulations. I know you just had a new, uh, a new uh, actually your first child, a baby girl. I did. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm away a lot. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm learning about the balance uh, of the personal life to the work life uh, up until this this my child being born it was always about work 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 so I'm really trying to balance it and where I get all my time is being on an airplane uh, it truly is my only alone time and I get to write my thoughts out and the only reason I write like look there's absolutely no money in writing a book mm-hmm. you know it's kind of like a, a labor of love but for me it's a labor of therapy um, I live in a very high pressure world very high risk world you know, I go through 10 meetings a day, 40 phone calls in the morning before the markets start between investment bankers, brokers, ideas, you know, talk to Doug, wherever he is in the world, or Olivier, the guys in my fund, the guys in my office. And writing is, it's almost like I don't really have much time to play music anymore, but it's replaced my therapy uh, of just trying to put my mind at ease. So I will be writing a new book, The Date. You know, I've got a lot of book offers because once you're on the New York Times, it's kind of a shoe in for your next book. But, uh, you know, really, I don't know when it will truly be done. Um, but I'm working on it and I've got a very unique idea. And I think one thing you know about me, it's going to be original. So it's going to be fun. And, you know, it's funny, Dan, I just got my first copy of my book being published in Japanese. It's now for sale in Japan. And it's pretty cool. Uh, it's seeing a your book written in a language that you really don't understand um, and it's different cover and they just do their own thing so it's kind of interesting and it's kind of fun in a way so that's why I do it. I imagine I know you worked really hard on that book uh, and for anyone who, who hasn't purchased it I believe you can get a link on uh, katusaresearch.com correct? Yeah I think so or Amazon or hell even the library has them you know it's funny. <laughs> I have a cabin out in the U.S. Uh, it's about an hour outside of Vancouver in Canada there. And my wife and I uh, were just going for a walk with our baby. And I said, hey, let's check out the library because there's always uh, books for sale. I've got a huge book collection. It's one of the things I do is collect books. And it was funny. They have a thing in the library for New York Times bestsellers. And it was me and uh, Anthony Robbins for his book, Money. Yeah. We were the two featured in the in the library. So I got a big kick out of that in this small town library of Point Roberts. They had uh, my book being featured. So it's kind of funny in a way. That's great. And then before we close out, you have a you have a conference uh in November. Uh I will be attending that. Uh and I imagine this is going to be the cream of the crop conference because you know and the people who the the, the legend this in this industry, the top investors, the top CEOs, they all want to work with you, so I'm I'm uh, I'm sure yourself and everyone who attends is going to have high expectations. Uh, can you let us know anything about the new Cambridge conference that's going to be in San Francisco, but it's going to be in partnership with Katusa Research? Correct. So what happened was uh, Cambridge House uh, runs the largest retail conferences in North America for mining companies. You know, at the peak of the market, they had over fifteen thousand attendees in the market. And, uh, you know, I've known the owners for a long time, Joe Martin and his son Jay. I've known these guys for a long time. I've always been speaking at them for a decade. And, you know, they were going through a rough patch. I said, look, guys, I got an idea. Now that I've left Casey, I can do whatever I want. And what you guys should focus on is bringing the absolute best in the markets. So what we decided to do was we took over the uh, Silver Show and we've got you know, silver, uh, Pan American silver, silver standard. We've got Gold Corp. We've got uh, First Majestic silver. We've got all the producers, Silver Wheaton, Franco Nevada. Um, Ross Beatty's coming in, uh, in to get inducted into the Resource Hall of Fame. So we have the absolute best speakers in the business. And that's the retail portion of the show. And then on a upstairs we have the institutional side where the biggest money managers in the resource sector are meeting with the presidents of all these companies and I've got speakers coming in around the world guys like Grant Williams who I think is one of the best speakers in the world on big macro stuff he's a good buddy of mine 
I recommend his stuff to everyone, the Real Vision guys, just cool stuff, original independent thinkers. Uh, I also have uh, uh, guys like Frank Holmes, Rick Rule, um, Ian Telfer, chairman of Gold Corp. Like, it's the who's who of mining is going to be there. I got Brent Cook to give a special uh, talk to the institutional guys and also the retail crowd. Basically, my rule is this, Dan. If I'm not willing to go to the talk, they're not going to be speaking at my conferences. That's so it's it's a joint venture between Cambridge, so it's called the Cambridge Catusa Conferences, and we have the San Fran show November 23rd, 24th, downtown San Fran. Go to the Cambridge House Conference for that. It's going to be up on my website soon. And then in Vancouver is going to be the big one. We'll probably have about 8,000 people to that, and that's the big show in town. So it's going to be fun and it's exciting, and we're going to have some very big name speakers there. Well, Marin Katusa, a man of high standards, and uh, like I said before the show started, uh, this is one of the individuals that no matter who you talk to, especially in the resource sector, as soon as you mention the name Marin Katusa, they're interested in what he has to say, what he's buying, and what he's about to do. Uh, Marin, thank you so much for your time, sir. We really appreciate it. You have a great week. Thanks, buddy. All the best.